Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Logitech McLaren G Challenge Summer Season Finals. Now, we've had an intense bout of competition globally with all four regions competing again here in Forza Motorsport. We've got a lot of exciting action to cover here today as well. But before we get into that, we want to let you guys know how our drivers made it to qualify for this grand finals here today. So taking a look at our roadmap, here is the path our competitors took. Most notably, we've got two different ways to qualify for the grand finals in this summer season. Race Days was an open competition that took place in several retail locations across the globe. And then of course, there was also the G Challenge Online, where competitors faced off against each other in the Forza Motorsport Rivals leaderboard. Then both sets of competitors made it to their own semifinals where they all filtered into the grand finals you are about to see here today. Now, of course, all of these competitors are competing for a big amount of money if you're able to get first place. But the nice thing is everyone who qualified for our grand finals is going to be walking away with something. Now, there are 16 qualified drivers per region who will be competing in two races with five qualifying laps and 15 racing laps. Our two races today are gonna take place on Nurburgring and Laguna Seca. And on Nurburgring, our drivers will be driving that McLaren 620R and on Laguna Seca, the McLaren 720S Coupe. Now our prizing, again, first place in each region is going to be walking away with $1,500 as well as earning a trip to the McLaren Technology Center. Second place will be walking away with $1,000, third, $600, fourth, $400, fifth and sixth, $250, seventh and eighth, $200, ninth and twelfth, $100 and 13th through 16th will be receiving $50. Now we have a jam packed schedule for you here today. We're going to be covering all four regions of competition spanning the globe. So you won't want to go anywhere and miss any of this exciting action. Jumping into the LATAM Grand Finals, we begin with the first qualifying session on Nurburgring. Throughout the session, several drivers, including Angeloni, Energy, Toys, Vinny, and Wesley, were battling it out for pole. Then on lap three, provisional pole was taken by Energy. However, in the final moments of the intense fight for first, it was RBM M. Gezin that took pole on the final lap. It was a clean lap one as we began our first race in Ladam on Nurburgring. But unfortunately, our race leader, RBM and Gezin, picked up a half second penalty, which forced them to push all that much harder to maintain a solid lead. Vinny in particular had an incredible first lap, passing car after car, gaining seven positions. It was non-stop action from lap four all the way to the end of the race, as we witnessed incredibly tight battles. But by the final lap, RBM and Gezin had pulled away by five seconds, erasing any previous penalty concerns. Taking a look at our lat -M race one results, it was RBM and Gezin finishing solidly on top of the leaderboard with our fastest lap going to RBM Julio with an impressive time. With only two races to determine the grand finals champion, the qualifying session on Laguna Seca required perfection from our drivers. Our LATAM standings leader, RBM Magezin, started their final lap on provisional pole, but energy was hot on their trail and was able to quickly steal the top spot. At this point, the final lap was an absolute shootout. 
with Energy and Magezin maintaining their top spots and Vinny shooting up to P3 at the very end of the session. Our current standings leader, RBM Magezin, had a dramatic start on Laguna Seca. After a brief incident, they fell from P2 to last place. While RBM Magezin mounts a recovery and attempts to climb back up the grid, Wesley, Toys, and Vinny start a vicious battle during lap two. At the same time, lots of action from P7 through P9 had occurred. RBM Magezin had already made their way back up and was in a great battle with Julio and Quirina. From lap three through lap seven, the entire tower shuffled several times. All of the drivers were pushing it to their absolute limit, and there was absolutely no room for error at this point. During lap seven, however, Wesley makes a small error and loses control of his McLaren, fortunately was quickly able to save it. Toys was also able to complete the overtake and moves he was trying to make. By lap 9 of 15, Toys, Wesley, Vinny, and Angeloni are all fighting for positions in the top five, with RBM Magezin not too far behind. Vinny and Toys had a tremendous battle on the final lap for P2, but an incident resulted in Vinny dropping down to P6. Energy was able to win the race with a 10 second gap ahead of the rest of the pack. So with that being said, the race two results on Laguna Seca were as follows. EBTE Energy was able to finish in first place in those final moments and RBM Wesley, who finished in second, also was awarded that extra point for the fastest lap. With that second race on Laguna Seca concluding, that allowed us to tally up those point totals and see where our final standings for the LATAM Grand Finals fell. Now, taking a look at this leaderboard, it was RBM Wesley, able to finish in first with 43 points through some really consistent driving, but the entire top four, all a tight race with third and fourth being tied with 39 points. And of course, RBM Magezin with that unfortunate incident in the second race did take a tumble, but RBM Wesley, again, with a few of those extra points he was able to accumulate is our LATAM Grand Finals champion. So that concludes our coverage of the LAT-AM region for the Logitech McLaren G Challenge. Now, we are going to throw it to a brief commercial break, but before we do that, we were able to sit down and talk to Wesley about his victory. This season was really hard for me because I started work, so I have like two, three hours to play all days, but I qualified in the first rival, in the Nervous GP circuit, and I qualified in position 6, I think, global, and in the semi-final I finished second, so I qualified to the finals in the first semi-finals, and after that I started play and practice for the finals. I started practicing like two months ago and I was growing up beach by a beach and I was improving a lot day by day and I practiced all days in the night with MG Zin, my teammate. I think both combos was really hard, really easy to die to go off the track and my focus was to be consistency and don't die in the race and i think i did my job i did a good job my favorite moment in the final was the battle with will toys he was really consistent and fast so 
we battle all the race and that was really fun. I'm feeling really amazing. Uh, the past season, I the final was three races. I won race one and race three. In the second race, my game crashed and I lost the championship. After that, I was really sad, but that gave me more motivation to be here and practice a lot. And uh, in this final, I don't won one race, but I was the champion. So you need luck to, to be the champion. The racing series is a new milestone in Logitech G. All the great old wheels, the G29, the G920, the G923, they all have their own unique way of connecting to each other, but there's no room for expansion with those products. So the question arose was, you know, what if we were to give the opportunity for the racer to switch out from a, a drifting wheel to a GT rim? With the wheel hubs that we've created, that's got a very specific button set, but you can replace any of the steering wheels. And the real lovely aspect to this was we could give the user, driver, and the racer the opportunity to experience different genres of race. That allows drivers to craft high quality, customized setups that resonate with your individual racing style. When we start with the design, we always start sketching. But very often, once we've got sketches, we start discussing with engineering. We had three rounds of engineering testing or user testing where we invited in users from sim racing and every single round of feedback we refine, you know, the product based on what they tell us. In this sim racing lab, again, we're gonna use data to, to really analyze what a driver needs. We've used everything from eye tracking to the inputs from the pedals, the inputs from the, let's just say input devices, the wheel and the pedals, the shifter. Uh, we're taking that and we're compiling it so that we can build different products based on those individuals' needs for all consumers and all drivers. I don't know of anyone else in the industry that's actually doing this kind of research into their products to see how their products are affecting performance of their users. We've built the product to make sure that it's as reliable as possible. So the innovations in engineering that I'd say we're most proud of is the sequential handbrake and shifter toolless changeover. This is now a patented system, so it's really easy for the user to just switch between modes. If you give people the tools to do what they want, they will. They will just go off and have fun. You know, 75 is all it takes for a pair of tires to burn off. What up everybody, I'm Matt Field and I am a professional drifter. When I was like 16 years old and got myself a car and tried to do donuts, I was like, oh, I could do donuts. Like, let me try to do some figure eights. And I was like, I could do figure eights. I was good at it right away and I was like, this is awesome, let's keep going. It completely consumed my life immediately. The community is really what has moved drifting so far forward. It's all based off of people giving it their all and people like me who say, like, drifting is my life and I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to elevate the sport. But you know what's freaking amazing? You could wake up tomorrow and be like, I'm going to be a drift driver. And you actually could. And even if you want to take it one step further and be like, I, I think I want to be a professional drift driver, you, you probably can. It's crazy. Maybe it's not realistic for you to be able to buy my race car. Well, there's only one thing for you. You gotta get in the sim. Between balance and the strive to get better, it's like drifting keeps you completely consumed because there's always that next step. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to your coverage of the Logitech McLaren G Challenge Summer Finals. Moving on to the APAC region, we continued to see some amazing racing out of our competitors. With the first qualifying session on Nurburgring underway, four different drivers had the fastest lap at some point. In the later half, it was THR Lags that pulled away and maintained a solid lead. 
However, THR Lags did make a mistake on the fifth and final lap, and at this point, the final results were out of his hands. Moments later, this led to Craviator being able to secure P1 at the start. At the start of the race, Craviator was able to maintain their lead up until lap four. Now, as lap four continued, the top three really started to tighten up. THR Lags did pick up a one second penalty while in second place. And with the margins being so tight, it's difficult to close that gap. LS Goki did slowly start making their way up into the battle for P1. And at the start of our fifth lap, there was a three-way battle that ended up going side by side. Shortly after, as a result of this battle, THR Lags falls down into P3. Now, as the race progressed, the field did start to spread out, with the main focus being on the top three battle. On lap 10, however, the top three started to scramble. THR Lags was able to move back up to P1, and Goki falls to P3. Just one lap later, there was a ton of contact between all three drivers, but it was just clean enough to not result in any additional penalties. By lap 12, THR Lags had a one second lead in first place, but the earlier one second penalty from the first lap was a huge threat to their result. Craviator and Goki started to push hard and the battle for P2 in the final laps of the race. Through the combination of aggressive battling between the two and THR Lags absolutely on the limit, Lags managed to pull away by 3.7 seconds and nullified the penalty in the early stages of the race. So with all of that intense battling in our top three positions, here's how the results looked after race one. It was THR Lags securing that first place victory, but only by a hair, as JSR Craviator and LS Goki put up an impressive performance as well. However, it is worth noting that THR Lags was also able to secure the fastest lap, earning them an additional point. After all the intensity we saw in race number one, the second and final qualifying session on Laguna Seca felt a bit more stable. The usual suspects, Goki, Craviator, and Lags all put in fast laps to the top of the tower. Going into the final lap of qualifying, Goki held provisional pole, but THR Lags was able to once again take the number one spot at the end of the session. At this point, with points and prizing on the line, the opening of the final racing session was clean. Early on, there were several battles across the grid, including another battle from Lags, Craviator, and Goki in the top three, but also a huge four-driver battle in the middle of the pack. This battle continued for a few laps where all of the drivers were able to maintain a consistent pace. Dez, in particular, was able to make a great overtake at the start of lap six. There continued to be clean racing throughout the top six, but the spread of drivers began to increase. As the race winds down, there's less and less time to start to close some of these gaps. Goki, however, was able to close the gap within three tenths to THR Lags, who continued to hold P1. And look at this. On the final straight of the final lap, THR Lags and Goki go side by side to the very end. But it was THR Lags who was able to secure the win in the very end. And with that impressive finish, here are your standings for race two on Laguna Seca. 
THR Langs was able to finish in first place, closely followed by LS Goki. And in third place, it was JSR Graviator, with LS Goki winning the additional point for the fastest lap. With race two having concluded on Laguna Seca, that gave us the ability to calculate our final standings for the APAC region. So as you see here, it is THR Lags finishing in first with 51 points and a crazy close battle between our second and third place finishers with LS Goki finishing with 43 points and JSR Craviator finishing with 42. And with that being said, concludes our coverage of the APAC region, but we were able to sit down and talk to THR Lags about his victory, so don't go anywhere. Hey guys, my name's Taylor, or you might know me online by THR Lags, and I am the Asia Pacific Champion for the Logitech McLaren G Challenge. Um, I think from the start, if I, if I won the first race at Nürburgring, I was a lot more relaxed after that because I knew that I was quicker on pace than a lot of other people. Um, but yeah, I've, after I made that pass in the first race, I was a lot nervous before that, but after that it was not relaxed, but I knew I had, uh, had it a bit easier. I could, I guess, yeah, relax a little bit more going into the second race. Um, I think the Laguna track with that car it was just more about staying on the track, not dropping a tyre, because around there it was pretty easy to drop a tyre. So I just tried to focus up as much as I could, keep the tyres on the track. I felt like I did that reasonably well. I think in the back of my head I was sort of doing the points system as well and I knew I'd won anyway, so once I crossed the line it was just pure relief. I was pretty happy to finally win something to be honest. Um, hasn't quite sunk in just yet, but yeah, I was happy. It was just more, I can relax now, be happy, chill, job's done. Um, for me, especially in that first race, it was more... Um, once I didn't qualify on pole, I just focused on the car in front, take it corner by corner, lap by lap. It was a pretty, well, a decently long race, so I was just more focusing on the car in front of me, what I needed to do. Um, and when I dropped back two positions, I could see the cars fighting in front of me, so I just needed to take every corner as best I could, because I knew I'd catch up eventually. Um, but I'd definitely say if you're struggling with that, like I was, I think just taking it lap by lap, especially in the beginning, you don't need to worry about the end of the race. Anything can happen. Um, but yeah, I think it's just more trying to focus up as much as you can on like corner entries, corner exits, and yeah, just take it lap by lap. You never know what can happen. The racing series is a new milestone in Logitech G. All the great old wheels, the G29, the G920, the G923, they all have their own unique way of connecting to each other, but there's no room for expansion with those products. So the question arose was, you know, what if we were to give the opportunity for the racer to switch out from a, a drifting wheel to a GT rim? With the wheel hubs that we've created, that's got a very specific button set, but you can replace any of the steering wheels. And the real lovely aspect to this was we could give the user, driver and the racer the opportunity to experience different genres of race. That allows drivers to craft high quality, customized setups that resonate with your individual racing style. When we start with the design, we always start sketching. But very often, once we've got sketches, we start discussing with engineering. We had three rounds of engineering testing or user testing where we invited in users from sim racing and every single round of feedback we refine you know, the product based on what they tell us. In this sim racing lab, again, we're going to use data to, to really analyze what a driver needs. We've used everything from eye tracking to the inputs from the pedals, the inputs from the 
let's just say input devices, the wheel and the pedals, the shifter. Uh, we're taking that and we're compiling it so that we can build different products based on those individuals' needs for all consumers and all drivers. I don't know of anyone else in the industry that's actually doing this kind of research into their products to see how their products are affecting performance of their users. We've built the product to make sure that it's as reliable as possible. So the innovations in engineering that I'd say we're most proud of is the sequential handbrake and shifter toolless changeover. This is now a patented system, so it's really easy for the user to just switch between modes. If you give people the tools to do what they want, they will. They will just go off and have fun. You know, 75 is all it takes for a pair of tires to burn off. What up everybody, I'm Matt Field and I am a professional drifter. When I was like 16 years old and got myself a car and tried to do donuts, I was like, oh, I could do donuts. Like, let me try to do some figure eights. And I was like, I could do figure eights. I was good at it right away and I was like, this is awesome, let's keep going. It completely consumed my life immediately. The community is really what has moved drifting so far forward. It's all based off of people giving it their all and people like me who say like drifting is my life and I'm gonna do everything that I possibly can to elevate the sport. But you know what's freaking amazing? You can wake up tomorrow and be like, I'm gonna be a drift driver and you actually could. And even if you wanna take it one step further and be like, I, I think I wanna be a professional drift driver, you, you probably can, it's crazy. Maybe it's not realistic for you to be able to buy my race car. Well, there's only one thing for you. You gotta get in the sim. Between balance and the strive to get better, it's like drifting keeps you completely consumed because there's always that next step. Welcome back to your coverage of the Logitech McLaren G Challenge Summer Season Finals. We hope you've enjoyed the action on display so far. We're only halfway done. Next up, we'll be jumping in to the EMEA region to see if Boquet can repeat his victory from the previous season. Throughout the first qualifying session on Nurburgring, it was Mitch and Barco that were repeatedly trading positions in the top three. And of course, Boquet last season's champion managed to take provisional pole after the fourth lap. During the fifth and final lap, positions throughout the grid remained stable and Boquet maintained and secured the pole position. In the first four laps of the race on Nurburgring, it was a clean start with not too much movement in the standings. As the session continued, we had a few exciting battles in the midfield. Both Kaiser, Miguel, and Kors overtake Garmite on lap four. Shorty, Breezy, and Batum battle between lap seven and eight, with Shorty in particular falling down a couple positions, but quickly recovered. In the final laps, the field began to spread, and Boquet won with a convincing margin of 4.6 seconds. And with race one on Nurburgring concluding, here are your EMEA standings. TPR Boquet, of course, finishing in first and maintaining that fastest lap throughout the race with RBM Mitch and ESV Barcode also putting up convincing performances. As we then moved on to our qualifying on Laguna Seca, this session played out with the same drivers shuffling throughout the top five. Mitch, Miguel, and Barcode in particular had very competitive laps, but it was Boquet yet again that dominated and secured the pole position for the final race. Moving ahead to the race start on Laguna Seca, there was a ton of movement, but Boquet was able to safely pull away by 1.1 seconds. Spectre and Course were both able to move up two positions on the first lap. Throughout the entire race session, we witnessed several tight battles for each point on the line. Shorty, Spectre, and Garmite had a great battle that went from lap three 
all the way to lap eight. The standings were consistently shuffled. Spectre briefly went into the dirt, but was able to recover and successfully fight off Garmite, who quickly tried to take advantage. By lap seven, Spectre went into the dirt at the same exact location, but this time around, Garmite was able to complete the overtake. But by the time the final lap rolled around, Boquette had pulled ahead by 5.4 seconds with an overall incredible race and another dominant performance. With race two on Laguna Seca concluding, here were your standings. With again, TPR Boquet finishing in first place and also receiving another point for the fastest lap, but the rest of the grid still very competitive with RBM Mitch and ESV Barcode showing consistent performances. With race two being concluded and our points being available to calculate, the final results were as follows. It was TPR Boquette with a perfect score of 52 points, finishing in first for both races and also receiving additional points for the fastest lap. But RBM Mitch and ESV Barcode again being rewarded for their consistent performances with Mitch finishing with 44 points and Barcode finishing with 40. So that is where the dust settled in our EMEA region with Boquette now becoming a two-time LMGC Forza Motorsport Champion. And we were fortunate enough to take some time and chat with Boquette about his victory and really just getting his thoughts overall. So you won't want to miss that. Stay tuned. Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Boquette and uh, online I'm known as TPR Boquette and I am now the current Logitech G Challenge champion for EMEA. That's how I qualified. I didn't actually do the online time trials like the majority of other drivers. And yeah, I think it helped me. I think it, I think it helped me. And it also left an element of surprise for the other drivers who might not have exactly known how my pace would be because I didn't have a time on the board. So they might have struggled for a reference as to how fast I would be because I did it on race days instead of online. The race day semi-final, I think it was mid-August and then the actual grand final was mid-September. So I was even strategic in the race day semi-final where I didn't want to really show my true pace. So whether it's at a benchmark, it hit. imagine I set a 204.0 in the race day semi-final when everyone else is driving, say, a 204.5, they would know they'd have to push extremely hard in the grand finals and maybe try and push for time they might not have seen uh, in their own practice. So in the race day semi-final, I think I just did roughly the times everyone else was doing. Uh, and then I, I had about a month then afterwards. I'd already been working on tunes prior to this and uh, Nürburgring, you could, on the 620R, you could change almost everything. I think it was everything apart from the differential, the gears and the, uh, the front aero. So you could change everything else. On, on the second combination, you could only change three things and tire pressures and braking, uh, brake pressure are almost personal preference. So uh, you could only change the anti-roll bars for that. So there wasn't as much wiggle room uh so the majority of my tuning practice was spent on the first combination making sure i got it really really dialed in so whilst everyone else was hot lapping and the hot laps by the way even ran after my race day semi-final so other people were hot lapping on the, the laguna seca combo whilst i was fully uh tuning these cars another interesting point is i had someone uh, one of the semi-finalists is called c1 muns he raced in the semi-finals in the MEA and he actually asked me to try his tune uh, for Nürburgring and it actually just ended up being quicker than what I was running. So uh, I, I lucked out there massively because he asked me to test the tune for him and I said this tune is amazing if you make these small changes. So the tune he provided to me actually ended up being a base to what I used in the grand finals. Uh, so that was a stroke of luck as well. 
But yeah, what I think the main advantage I was granted from this was tuning whilst everyone else was perhaps getting used to stock cars and how they drive instead of putting months of work into tune cars. Yeah, so I think I had an advantage because of the race days, whereas everyone else was practicing on the leaderboard. I could see their times and use them as a reference. And I was also, whilst they were driving the stock tune on the leaderboard, I was also working on tunes for the races because we knew at that point that the races would, would allow tuning, but the actual leaderboards, uh, the rivals were forced stock. So whilst everyone was perhaps getting used to the stock car, I was able to see what times they were doing and able to work on the tunes perhaps before anyone else was working on the tunes. So the first time I qualified online and I did well in the online time trials and it was good, but you have to get used to the racing environment, which time trial can lead you down the wrong path of that. Because if you're pushing every corner, every lap on a time trial, knowing you can instantly press reset if it goes wrong, you might develop bad habits when it comes to racing for half an hour because you, you can't reset if you have a crash. So I think I had the advantage there by going to race days and the majority of that was, it allowed me to work on my tunes before anyone else was working on them. And I think that was a massive advantage for me going into the races uh, for the finals. Both of my qualifying sessions were really good. I had a plan of going in and setting up a banker safe lap on lap one. Uh, and both of those were really good. They went exactly to plan. So I was able to push them down for the, uh, for the following laps. Laguna Seca right at 24.7, which was my uh, optimal goal for uh, the Laguna Seca qualifying. Uh, my personal best qualifying session before that was at 24.7. So I essentially hit my PB in qualifying there, which was a really good moment. But the best moment for me was lap 14 of Nürburgring uh, because I had about a three second gap on uh, Mitch who was in P2. Uh, and the way the point scoring system slightly changed this uh, season, so you would get a fast, uh, you would get a point for the fastest lap. So I knew I had a buffer to P2, so I was pushing for a really fast lap to ensure I got that extra point, which would make my life a lot easier in the second race if I got it. And lap 14, I managed to hit a 203.4 around Nürburgring, which is uh, going into the race, my best lap I had done in practice was a 203.8. So having the track rubbered in with the extra 15 cars uh, helped push the time down, but it was also just a really good lap. Uh, my second fastest lap in the race was a 203.7. So this, this 203.4 was a monster lap and it was the exact strategy that I was trying to hit was to get a lap like that to ensure I'd have the maximum points going into uh, the second race. So at the end of the first race, knowing I had the fastest lap, the, the uh, strategy for the second race then, all I had to do to ensure victory was to come second place by less than 4.5 seconds because that's how the uh, system worked. Uh, if if Mitch beat me by less than 4.5 seconds, I still would have won because the total time would have been less for me. So race one went exactly to plan and the highlight of race one for me was lap 14 where I just, everything just seemed to click for me on this one lap, lap 14. I don't remember making a single mistake and yeah, when I saw 203.4 pop up at the end of the lap, I knew I could just take it easy then for the last lap, just don't crash and race one would be mine basically so in racing i've i'm looking forward to the next g challenge uh i'd i'd like to keep this streak up as long as i can i think i'm currently racing the best i ever have so i want to make the most of that if there's any competitions going i'll i'll put my hat in the ring uh, and try my best in each one um I'm probably going to take a small break from Forza after this one. I, I put a lot of hours in for this competition, uh, so a, a small break uh, is uh, will be healthy for me. But as soon as the next competition drops, I will be there. Uh, uh, as long as I'm eligible, I will be there. Outside of racing in general, I've got an uh, exam coming up 
uh, as I work in insurance, so I have an actual written exam coming up, which I'm going to have to work hard for. Uh, so the break from Forza for now will probably help me with that. It'll be uh, my, a lot of my time will be going into studying for that. So that'll be good for my actual career outside of Forza. But other than that, no, I'm uh, I'm mainly just looking forward to the next G challenge. And I'm also looking forward to going to the uh, McLaren Technology Center as well. I'm really excited for that. And uh, hopefully meeting up with uh, some, some guys that I saw last time as well. I know Dan Nyman won who I met last time, so that'll be uh, great to see him again. The racing series is a new milestone in Logitech G. All the great old wheels, the G29, the G920, the G923, they all have their own unique way of connecting to each other, but there's no room for expansion with those products. So the question arose was, you know, what if we were to give the opportunity for the racer to switch out from a, a drifting wheel to a GT rim? With the wheel hubs that we've created, that's got a very specific button set, but you can replace any of the steering wheels. And the real lovely aspect to this was we could give the user, driver and the racer the opportunity to experience different genres of race. That allows drivers to craft high quality, customized setups that resonate with your individual racing style. When we start with the design, we always start sketching. But very often, once we've got sketches, we start discussing with engineering. We had three rounds of engineering testing or user testing, where we invited in users from sim racing. And every single round of feedback, we refine you know, the product based on what they tell us. In this sim racing lab, again, we're going to use data to, to really analyze what a driver needs. We've used everything from eye tracking to the inputs from the pedals, the inputs from the, let's just say, input devices, the wheel and the pedals, the shifter. Uh, we're taking that and we're compiling it so that we can build different products based on those individuals' needs for all consumers and all drivers. I don't know of anyone else in the industry that's actually doing this kind of research into their products to see how their products are affecting performance of their users. We've built the product to make sure that it's as reliable as possible. So the innovations in engineering that I'd say we're most proud of is the sequential handbrake and shifter toolless changeover. This is now a patented system, so it's really easy for the user to just switch between modes. If you give people the tools to do what they want, they will. They will just go off and have fun. You know, 75 is all it takes for a pair of tires to burn off. What up everybody, I'm Matt Field and I am a professional drifter. When I was like 16 years old and got myself a car and tried to do donuts, I was like, oh, I could do donuts. Like, let me try to do some figure eights. And I was like, I could do figure eights. I was good at it right away and I was like, this is awesome, let's keep going. It completely consumed my life immediately. The community is really what has moved drifting so far forward. It's all based off of people giving it their all and people like me who say like drifting is my life and I'm gonna do everything that I possibly can to elevate the sport. But you know what's freaking amazing? You could wake up tomorrow and be like, I'm gonna be a drift driver and you actually could. And even if you wanna take it one step further and be like, I, I think I wanna be a professional drift driver, you, you probably can, it's crazy. Maybe it's not realistic for you to be able to buy my race car. Well, there's only one thing for you. You gotta get in the sim. Between balance and the strive to get better, it's like drifting keeps you completely consumed because there's always that next step. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to your coverage of the Logitech McLaren G Challenge Summer Season Finals. We've got our fourth and final region to present here for you today. So let's jump in to how things went in NA. As we jump into our first qualifying session on Nurburgring, this was an intense one for the North American region. Vettel took provisional pole first, but Force One quickly responded with a faster lap. 
This battle continued each lap in qualifying with both drivers trading for P1 repeatedly. There was a shootout on the fifth and final qualifying lap, but Force One was able to maintain that P1 position. Now, as we started our first race, Force One pulls ahead early at the start of our Nurburgring race session. Right behind him, however, there was a great three-way battle between Benz, Whiteout, and Vanquish, with a little bit of contact as the battle waged on. Whiteout and Benz did trade positions back and forth throughout our sixth lap. Closer to the top on the same lap, Mobzy and Vettel have been getting close. Mobzy was able to cut down the gap to one-tenth. On lap seven, a five-way battle broke out between Bowtie, Ascari, Whiteout, Vanquish, and Benz. But as the dust settled, Force One built up a five-second lead and won the race in convincing fashion. So with race one concluding in our North American region, here are your results after that first race. Of course, it was THR Force One finishing convincingly in first, SDW Vettel coming in second, and SVR Mobzy finishing in third. And of course, for that extra point, it was SDW Vettel putting in the fastest lap. As we move on to our second qualifying session on Laguna Seca, the battle between Force One and Vettel continued on, once again trading P1 back and forth throughout the session. Force One puts in an incredible lap and pulls three tenths ahead of P2, securing him the pole position. Ascari had an impressive performance as well and secured P3 going into the final race of the summer season. Moving on to the final race of the Grand Finals, Force One pulls ahead and holds on to P1 through lap one. However, there was a ton of shuffling and battling behind it. Another five-way battle broke out behind our race leader. During this battle, there were several incidents and overtakes from the drivers pushing it to the absolute limit. The race began to stabilize until the very end, where the drivers began their final push to claim as many points as possible. On one end, Vanquish and Benz fought for P7, and Popping, Tsunami, and Whiteout duked it out for the 10th spot. Vettel was able to cut down on Force One's lead in the closing stages of the race, but ultimately, Force One completed the sweep and won both races. And here are your results after the conclusion of race number two, with THR Force One finishing in first yet again, but in second and third place, SDW Vettel and SDW Ascari also put in some solid performances, with our fastest lap going to SDW Vettel to close out the NA region. And with our two races in North America concluding, that gives us the opportunity to add up those points and declare ourselves a winner. So when the dust finally settled, of course, THR Force One finishing in first with 50 points, SDW Vettel finishing in second with 46 points, and SVR Mobzy finishing in third with 38 points. Of course, two additional points going to SDW Vettel for two of our fastest laps, but it was two first place finishes for THR Force One that allowed him to claim the crown yet again and be a two-time NA champion. And that concludes our North American region for this season of the Logitech McLaren G Challenge. And of course, we had the pleasure of sitting down and talking to THR Force One about his back-to-back -back victories.
Hey there, I'm Daniel Nyman. You probably know me better as THR Force One, and I am your Logitech McLaren G Challenge champion for North America. I think the first thing I really enjoyed was, was the cars themselves. The McLaren 620R, for example, is a car that you really drive with more of a slow in, fast out sort of mentality, and that adapted to the McLaren 720 as well. Um, both cars, because you're required to kind of get all your rotation done entering a corner, and you're really backing the corner up and getting the process of turning done before you get to the apex, it suited my driving style a little bit better, better than last season's cars, where you were kind of all the way through the corner still fighting against what the car was trying to do. Um, it helped me set the cars up a little bit nicer. They fit my driving style better because of those setups. And I think I went into the races with a better sense of comfort in terms of, I know I can drive at a certain level of aggression into a corner and be fine. And when you take the concern about crashing the car out a little bit, it just opens up so many opportunities for you to chase that extra tenth of a second or two tenths of a second. And that all came together to really help me put together complete laps that were much closer to the perfection I was kind of hoping to achieve over the course of both races and kind of develop more of a, a race both at Nürburgring and at Laguna Seca where I was just kind of controlling the pace of the race. Obviously it's a difficult when you have so many drivers, especially this season, that are pretty close on pace when you lose a position or two there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to make that back up and also when you're talking about an event like this where 16 cars are going very close together into the first corner there can be contact involved and, and you really want to avoid that happening too so um, my biggest stressor was probably making sure that i've picked the right line and the right breaking point to protect myself but also make it through that first uh, section of corners on both circuits to kind of solidify a lead early in the race once you got that first half second to a second margin made, you're straight into that race management mode and just kind of mirroring the moves that your drivers are, are making behind you in order to protect that lead. But you can kind of, once again, just lower your stress level, lower the heart rate a little bit and take control of the race from a much better position. So the race starts always important, but when you have two tracks like the ones we had this past season, it's more important than ever. There are two moments for me actually in both the first and the second race that kind of bothered me after the fact. Um, and especially in the first race at, at the Nürburgring, we were driving the 620R and my pace was something I was very happy with going into the race. And getting into the first six or seven laps, I had settled into something that I was comfortable with, but knowing that I was also on for a pretty good race time. And from there, you're, you're looking at the points available and how things can work against you, especially with the shortened format this past season. You know, you have two races instead of three. And that makes getting a point for the fastest lap time more important in this series, especially with the first race. If you can take the win and the fastest lap point, it kind of allows you to trade back and forth with the driver that finished second in the first race. You don't necessarily have to win that one as long as you can secure another fastest lap. Uh, coming into the final two laps of that race, I decided to stop managing and start pushing. I had about a four second lead at the time, so I knew I could afford to maybe cut a track accidentally, cut a corner accidentally, and give up a second or two in penalty time. So I'm pushing lap 14 at the Nürburgring on for a time that would have been my personal best for the entire month leading up to that race, and I cut the chicane. Get into the lap after that, it's the last lap of the race same story. I cut it by maybe three or four pixels, but obviously a corner cut is a corner cut. Both of those lap times were invalid. I come to the line, come to find that I was three thousandths of a second away from getting the fastest lap point. It kind of bothered me a little bit because I knew going into Laguna Seca I had to nail qualifying and drive perfectly that race to win again. Otherwise, things could be up in the air and the championship wasn't guaranteed. And I had a similar sort of outcome at Laguna Seca as well. Fortunately, crossing the line first in both races still resulted in the championship, but I don't know. I felt like I left something on the table there by not getting the full uh, 52 points on offer. I mean, obviously the number one goal here is to go for a three-peat. I don't know if the opportunity will present itself, but I think Jacob in the European region would have a very similar answer. Being a three-time champion of a series says a lot about not only the, the preparation that you're able to put in and the raw speed, but also the longevity that you have and your ability over different car and track combinations and new environments and often against new competitors too. I, it would be a very special for me 
to win three in a row. So that's goal number one. But we have a little bit of a break now, and I've taken a couple of days off from racing in the days following this past championship. I, I think now is a good opportunity, especially with the direction of the game itself, to take on more of a community role, maybe broadcasting races and, and helping to uplift the community side of things too, so that the next time we get to a championship like this, there is a level of passion that is even higher and more drivers that are feeling energetic about participating and, and capable of participating for, for good results as well. I think we could really grow the scene in the North American region. I think this past season was a great example of that with the level of competitiveness that you saw through the midfield. And they were a lot closer, I would say, towards the front of the field too. With a little bit of effort, and some of that effort coming from me as well, I think by the time we get to the next big championship on Forza Motorsport, we could have a whole lot more drivers that see themselves as a potential champion and would be encouraged to push for that too. I'm just hoping that maybe through some broadcasting of community events and just putting effort into the community, we could probably get there with a lot more excitement about the next event as well. The racing series is a new milestone in Logitech G. All the great old wheels, the G29, the G920, the G923, they all have their own unique way of connecting to each other, but there's no room for expansion with those products. So the question arose was, you know, what if we were to give the opportunity for the racer to switch out from a, a drifting wheel to a GT rim? With the wheel hubs that we've created, that's got a very specific button set, but you can replace any of the steering wheels. And the real lovely aspect to this was we could give the user, driver, and the racer the opportunity to experience different genres of race. That allows drivers to craft high quality, customized setups that resonate with your individual racing style. When we start with the design, we always start sketching. But very often, once we've got sketches, we start discussing with engineering. We had three rounds of engineering testing or user testing where we invited in users from sim racing and every single round of feedback we refine, you know, the product based on what they tell us. In this sim racing lab, again, we're gonna use data to, to really analyze what a driver needs. We've used everything from eye tracking to the inputs from the pedals, the inputs from the, let's just say input devices, the wheel and the pedals, the shifter. Uh, we're taking that and we're compiling it so that we can build different products based on those individuals' needs for all consumers and all drivers. I don't know of anyone else in the industry that's actually doing this kind of research into their products to see how their products are affecting performance of their users. We've built the product to make sure that it's as reliable as possible. So the innovations in engineering that I'd say we're most proud of is the sequential handbrake and shifter toolless changeover. This is now a patented system, so it's really easy for the user to just switch between modes. If you give people the tools to do what they want, they will. They will just go off and have fun. You know, 75 is all it takes for a pair of tires to burn off. What up everybody, I'm Matt Field and I am a professional drifter. When I was like 16 years old and got myself a car and tried to do donuts, I was like, oh, I could do donuts. Like, let me try to do some figure eights. And I was like, I could do figure eights. I was good at it right away and I was like, this is awesome, let's keep going. It completely consumed my life immediately. The community is really what has moved drifting so far forward. That's all based off of people giving it their all and people like me who say like drifting is my life and I'm gonna do everything that I possibly can to elevate the sport. But you know what's freaking amazing? You can wake up tomorrow and be like, I'm gonna be a drift driver and you actually could. And even if you wanna take it one step further and be like, I, I think I wanna be a professional drift driver, you, you probably can, it's crazy. Maybe it's not realistic for you to be able to buy my race car. Well, there's only one thing for you. You gotta get in the sim. Between balance and the strive to get better, it's like drifting keeps you completely consumed because there's always that next step. And with that, 
that concludes our coverage of the Logitech McLaren G Challenge summer season. Of course, we want to give a big congratulations to all of our winners, THR Lags, RBM Wesley, TPR Boquette, and THR Force One. And then, of course, a shout out to all of our partners who make this possible, Placey, Splunk, McLaren, Forza Motorsport, and all of you, the competitors at home, thank you again for participating in this amazing season. Thank you all for tuning in to the broadcast and watching along with us, and we'll see you all next time. Peace.